Malo lele to everyone to another episode of the Polynesian Eyes podcast here to a fall in San Antonio, Texas. We also have in, uh, with us today, Mr. Atearoa. Masi, how you doing? Doing well, thank you. Uh, Saturday evening here in New Zealand, South Auckland in particular, Manurewa. Uh, nice, cool, cold, chilly evening. And yeah, good to be here in the podcast. Sweet. Uh, we're going to do a couple uh, reactions today. We're going to start off with uh, uh, Elon Musk. Uh, looks like a video that was recorded, I think, about a year ago. And Elon kind of goes into why he keeps working and kind of his ideas about life and, and, and why he does what he does and just have some conversation on that. We do also have a funny video that a um, TikTok creator made about polynesians in general and that that was should be a fun one to look at and then if we have some time we've still having a lot of activity on social media we'll take a look at maybe a couple comments and uh we we don't have the time and energy unfortunately to respond to every comment hmm. but we we encourage the the interactions um and that's that's the route we're gonna take any questions on that, Mussy? that work for you? That sounds like an awesome uh, plan. And obviously, I mean, Elon Musk is making a lot of waves right now. I know he's having some legal battles with the Australian uh, government right now because. What? what? What's up with that? Yes. Are you not aware? Let's 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 take a look at that then. Um, it has what, to do with. They freedom of speech. speech yes no and that's i mean you know since living here in new zealand and australia you know probably a lot of the european countries too the whole government intervention is a real deal and probably mm -hmm. our society is moving well a lot of yeah. governments are moving that way of really watching people's speech and they're adding this uh well new zealand was about to add this law hate speech which was gonna restrict freedom of uh, expression and for freedom of speech so thank goodness that didn't happen with this new government that's we're in today that was under the labor government but um but yeah i mean dang that, and then that and that's the thing like it just because something sounds good that doesn't mean it's always good right like hate speech prevention like yeah we mm. we don't want people to be hateful to each other but you know, the, the questions is that typically I think comes to my mind when you have these kinds of discussions is you're going to prevent, you're going to provide this law that stops hate speech, but what are we giving up in return for that mm. quote unquote protection? And if what we're giving up is more valuable than what we're gaining, mm. then it doesn't make sense. And also who's going to determine what hate speech is? You know what? What some what something might be hateful to me to you, Masi, might be just fine, right? Mm -hmm. And who's going to regulate that? It's it's interesting. And, and you know, yeah. this is Elon Musk, and he his recent battle. He has some battle with Brazil. Brazil did the same thing, and he fought Brazil. And then now, you know, Brazil is now having massive flooding. So Elon's giving them free access to Starlink, mm. his internet just like access, Tonga. just like Tom. Like mm. So. Yeah, let's listen to this. It's just a short, I haven't even watched this, Mussy, but it, um, it should give a good description on what's going on with Elon Musk in Australia. Okay. Australia's battle with billionaire Elon Musk is escalating. His platform X refusing to remove a video of the Sydney church stabbing, claiming it oh. doesn't incite violence. Mm -hmm. We have nine federal politics reporter, Claudia Vridoljak, covering this story for us. And you know about that stabbing, right? Yes. Mussy? That yes. uh, Father Muri Muran, he's that uh, Orthodox, uh, mm -hmm. East Orthodox Church. He lost his yeah. eye. Yeah. And then the guy who stabbed him lost like two or three of his fingers mm -hmm. uh, because it was miraculous. It was actually miraculous. The 
the blade wouldn't open all the way when he first started stabbing, so it closed on his hands and supposedly cut off his fingers. Wow. Yeah, and and so the father is lucky to be alive, you know. And um, he's back into pre preaching, right? He, I, I swear, dude, yeah. I saw some videos. Yeah, he's he came out of preaching with a patch of you know, coming yeah, in his the eye. patch over his eye, and then he's like blessing the person, you know, calling no violence, and mm. he, he, very interesting. Mm. He even says. And this is how you know someone's a true believer and it's like built for hard stuff, man. He says he willingly sacrificed his eye for Jesus. And if and if that's the sacrifice he needs to make for for his faith, then he said, you know what? I have no problem with that. And he happily gives up his eye. Just this guy's mm. a real believer. Like when you get to that point, that type mm. of spiritual fortitude, man, mm. that's next level. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll jump back in here. I just just wanted to make sure that uh, we were all aware of what stabbing they're they're referring to. And Claudia, the opposition leader is now weighing in. Yeah, Jane, and while the coalition agrees this video shouldn't be viewed in Australia, opposition leader Peter Dutton now argues that Australia can't act as the internet police of the world. <laughs> Elon Musk's company X has hidden the content in Australia but refuses to take it down globally, issuing a statement overnight vowing to continue challenging the eSafety Commissioner's legal action. It will argue in court the clip does not encourage or provoke violence and that governments should not be able to censor what citizens of other countries see on Line, a sentiment shared by the bishop, the victim in the video, who is supporting X's lawyers in court. Here's what the opposition had to say on the show a moment ago. I'd love to say that it could be taken down so that no kid across the world could watch it, but uh, we strongly support the commissioner's position in relation to taking it down so that Australians can't view it. Uh, but we can't pretend that Australia can dictate to other countries around the world what people see within their countries. The federal government said... Why do you think, I mean, I've seen the video. It's a little gruesome, but I don't see how you say that's going to encourage. So, yeah, so this is my this is my thing. See, that's the opposition. And, of course, they're agreeing with the, you know, mostly agreeing with the commission or the Australia commission that they should take it down and all of that. But the, yeah, at the same time, he's still stating that they can't control, you know, the whole global thing. They want to distribute it. But to me, to me personally, that's not a good sign for freedom of speech. If you got both parties, and this is the two major parties of Australia acting the same way that government should control what is going to be spread out and what is not. So I don't know. Looks like uh, it's not good to be in. To me, it's not good to be uh, part of Australia if you got both parties still believing that same philosophy. Yeah, because so basically, my opinion. That's yeah, basically, they're saying we want to suppress everything in Australia, and that's fine. Yeah, and we he's just, using, yeah. And, yeah, and he's using kids, right? He's using. We don't want kids to see all these things, but sometimes, sometimes, sometimes people's got to see what evil is to to see, you know, that it's to real. really that it's real. And yeah, we can't we can't live in this this bubble until something really major happens, and then we don't know how to how to uh, deal with it. But yeah, that's just me. That's just my first uh, instinct uh, or to react to that opposition leader. Mm -hmm. I think they're the, they're called the liberal conservative and stuff. And to me, that is a bit concerning if that's the opposition and the labor is more of the government control. And if that's the opposition's feedback or reaction to this, that they still agree and still uh, want this e -com Australia commission to put this down and still fight in court. To me, yeah. Not it's the not greatest. I mean, not the great time for the future. But I don't know. That's just me. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, America is struggling with some of that stuff as well. Mm. But there's a different mentality, at least here in, in America. There's granted, uh, it, it's kind of, it seems to be the trend in the world. But mm. yeah. So I think that gives some good context on the background. I think that's yeah. good for there. And so, so mm. Elon, he's just, I mean, the guy is doing some crazy stuff, you know? Yeah. He has Tesla. He has Starlink. Um, he has uh, SpaceX, mm. and then he also has what's the one where they're putting the? They just put a chip in a guy's brain. I don't know if you've seen that, Mussy. Have you what, seen to help, that to help fight uh, dementia or something or what? No, to control like computers and stuff, and he can um, control a computer just using his brain. 
to wow. move the mouse. Have you seen that? No. I mean, I think I've heard of it, but I didn't see the. Yeah, it's actually pretty cool. Let's thing. let's let's take a look at that because I think, I mean, this is good. Just some good context, you know. Mm. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to remember. Is Elon Musk still ranked the number one uh, richest person in the world, or did Bezos? Because I know it's been between him and that Bezos guy is gonna go in that one and two. Yeah, it's it's Neuralink is the name of the of the technology. Um, I know the Tesla stock. There's nothing gone, more. Tesla stock has gone down a bit. Mm. Um, That's affected his. Uh, total uh, net worth yeah but i mean he's i think he is still the richest man let's let's go uh it's definitely in the top five huh oh definitely top three man and that's another thing to uh, right elon there. musk if it wasn't for elon musk and for uh x dang okay as of May 2024, Bernard Arnault, the CEO of LVMH, oh, the, the French, French luxury game. goods, two hundred and nine billion. Okay, okay, okay. So he's the number one now. Yeah. So some of the largest net worths: so Musk, Bill Gates, Larry mm. Ellison. So it's still. I mean, he's still top five. But it. Yeah. Oh, right here it says real time is number three. Yeah. Okay. So top yeah. Three. And it, you know, once once Tesla stock goes back up, then yeah. he'll be back to number one. Because a lot of these guys, it's not about cash; it's just how much value they have, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, with that being said, let's that's anyway. that's just still pretty crazy too. That um, you know, if it wasn't for X, you know, where we're, there's not going to be another social media platform that you probably get more accurate news because I know Facebook was doing a horrendous job with the whole fact checking and everything. So, man. Yeah. I mean, it got, like you said, horrendous is a good way to describe it because if I ever saw anything on Facebook that said fact checked, I was like, mm. lies, like yeah. unreliable. Like the moment it was fact checked, you're like, whatever they're, pushing back against is probably close to the truth i have as of recent as a lot of my my news and stuff i get from social media x is by far where i spend most of my time where i follow certain people where i go to find my news with certain mm. people that i trust um on x and like their their coverage and mm. you know and elon is really pushing that you know the citizen journal journalists mm. where he's telling people everybody should be a journalist and that's how i get my news now Nice. I, I I can't believe this. When I was in college, and even when I started college, I thought I would never be able to cut the cable, you know, mm. because it was just your news. You just had that mentality. Mm. It's like that. Mm. I haven't owned or I don't do cable for like five years now. Wow. Right. Like, I, it's just yeah, it's crazy. Mm. I never would have thought I would have been in that category. Um, <laughs> but. It's crazy how things change. Crazy yeah. how things change. But yeah, I get I get a lot of my news from X now X. rather than anywhere else. Let's watch this real quick. Twitter and all the controversy. Elon Musk makes some very cool things. This, in my opinion, is the coolest. Neuralink. And you recognize this homeboy, right? Yes. Um, Cuomo. What's his name? Co <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. This is the guy who told everybody to, you know, stay home. And he had that whole special about him hiding down in his basement and coming up. And then a guy on his bike has video of him leaving his home while he had COVID. <laughs> this is the same guy. It's hilarious. Yeah. He got, yeah. you know, and now he's. Um, BB, he's in, yeah, isn't he, with, uh, isn't he with, isn't he with, what's that new, is that other one that's pretty popular, PBD? He's with oh, that yeah. program now. Yeah. yeah. So he he went over there. So it, it, it's it's interesting. I mean, yeah. it's funny. Yeah. It's just I think it's hilarious. Yeah. It's a piece of tech, maybe the <laughs> one of the most developed technologies ever. It's a mm. brain chip that literally takes what you're thinking and turns it into action. Isn't that crazy? There's one that person crazy. who has it. 30 year old 
Nolan Arbaugh. So he is living the proof. He has been paralyzed, neck down, eight mm. years, freak accident at a lake, uh, left him unable to perform any tasks where you'd use your hands until now. To call this life changing, right, is an understatement. Nolan signed up for the mm. clinical trials. Oh. He wanted to be first. Now, this involved a brain surgery to get the chip implanted under his skull. He now says if he thinks it, he can do things only his hands could do before. Like what? Use a computer, play chess, play video games. Nolan Crazy. joins us now. Mm. Did I overhype it or did I say it? Did I say it correctly? <laughs> You better clarify that because you have a history of overhyping certain things, my friend. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's uh, probably um, undersold it. I mean, it's it's amazing. I undersold there's it. Not even words to describe. Yeah, there's not even words to describe how amazing this tech is. Wow. So. Oh my God, so much. I wanted to do like, I could do like two hours with uh, you in this conversation. I'm going to have to have you on the podcast so we yeah. can really talk through all this, but give people the, what they need to know. Like, let's start with the, when they gave you this option, were you afraid that like, oh no, like, you know, could I die when they do this to me? Or like, you know, take us through what it was like to have this operation and this risk. Oh, are we here to talk about Neuralink? I thought I was on here to talk about aliens. Um, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it was. Uh, it I wasn't I wasn't afraid at all. Um, I have my faith. I have a very strong relationship uh, with God, and I wasn't afraid uh, at all. I was at such peace. Um, I trust um, all the people that I worked with leading up to this. All the people on Crazy. the Barrows Neurological mm. Institute side. Uh, I trust all the people that have met at Neuralink. I was just excited to get started, honestly. Um, I couldn't wait. You know, it's really interesting being someone who's anchored to their faith. You know, there's always a belief that God doesn't give you more than you can handle. And it does make you wonder if this technology mm. wasn't a path that only you uh, could undertake. And once you came out of that surgery and they started to test it, how, w how does it work? Like, what did you start to experience? Yeah, um, it was really cool. Uh, right out of surgery, basically, they brought in a screen that showed a bunch of the neurons firing and said, this is your neuron. Um, these are your neurons firing real time. And my first thought, just initial reaction was to start trying to wiggle my fingers. And I saw some of the channels start spiking. And I was like, this is so cool. You guys got to see this. So I pointed them mm. to exactly what I was seeing. And the whole room just kind of broke out. Everyone was freaking out. Uh, we're all clapping. Like, it was it was amazing. Uh, so this chip is literally embedded into his brain mm. and picks up the electric signals from his brain. And then he can, he can, uh, like right here. Yeah. He well, can, the thing he is, can do things. I'm just thinking here too. So obviously this trial is successful. Is, is there going to be like a, a line of people who, you know, who are, you know, in mobile or paralyzed that they can uh, receive this kind of treatment and this is going to be a normal thing because it seems like it's that's the intent uh, that's how all yeah. these major technologies happen right you get your do the trials on animals and he first started with a monkey mm. i don't know if you know the story how they first started with the implant with the monkey mm. so I, what yeah, they, I, did, yeah, yeah. they you know they start with the joystick mm. and the monkey would come and play the game on a joystick and then he mm. would get a treat and then it got to the point after they implanted the chip into the brain of the monkey, they unplugged the joystick nah. and the monkey thinks he's using the joystick, but the chip's reading the monkey's brain. Mm. So then it goes to human trials. And then, like you're saying, once this is successful, then it's going to become normal and it gets passed on to to normal. They, he has had some setbacks. I think some of the wiring degraded. And mm. and the thing, so this is part of the whole process, right? You have to have these trials to figure out how to make it more mm. durable. But they've they've come up with some solutions to to solve that. And um, just yeah, I mean, That's Elon crazy. Musk is doing some crazy stuff. 
Mm. And this, you know, he's definitely one of the geniuses of our time, if not mm. the the genius of our time. Since what Albert Einstein? Yeah. I mean, but see what Elon Musk is just really unique because it's not just the theory, he's making it a reality, in my opinion. Okay. Right? Like his his stuff, he's taking it to the next level of like there's the theory and the idea, and then there's taking the idea and the theory and making it a reality. Mm. Like that, that is, and then it's affecting billions of people around the world. Mm. Okay. So, all right. So with that being Elon said, Musk. Elon Musk, let's hear from the man. I'm just going to put it at 1.25. Okay. Just to kind of. You know what? This one is not long, so we'll just keep it at one. Can you hear it okay, Masi? Yep. Why, why, good. Are, why do you care about the politics? Why do you care about multiplanetary species? Consciousness, you mentioned that, but like, yeah. do, do you ever get like, feel like that's maybe not the case or not true? Um, well, I mean, there's certainly at times when I you know, have doubts about these things. Um, I mean, I think it's a good question you ask because it goes to like what it, at a foundational level, what is my philosophy and why does it lead to this conclusion? So the, the reason uh, is that when I was uh, a teenager, I had like an existential crisis to try to figure out what's the meaning of life. Uh, it doesn't seem to be any meaning for me, at least the religious texts and I read all of them that I get my hands on did not seem convincing. Then I started reading the philosophers. Um, you know, be careful of like reading German philosophers as a teenager. It's definitely not going to help with your <laughs> depression. <laughs> so reading Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, I'm like, oh. <laughs> as an adult, it's much more manageable. But uh, as a kid, you're like, whoa. Um, so, so then I was like, man, I, I'm just like struggling to find meaning in life here. And then I read uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And basically what Douglas Adams was saying is that we don't really know what the right questions are to ask. Like the question is not what's the meaning of life. You know, uh, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, in the Earth, Earth, it turns out, is this big computer that's, and, and its goal is to uh, answer the question, what's the meaning of life? And, and Earth comes up. Any thoughts so far, Masi? No, I mean, he's definitely, he's definitely have, you know, he definitely has a lot of purpose. That's what I've noticed in, uh, in what he's doing. He's not. He's not, uh, even though he, you know, most people, most in most situations when you make like your big money thing, you tend to want to enjoy the rest of your life. But obviously he has so much ideas that he still wants to accomplish, which creates purpose. And uh, you know, that saying that when you love something what, that you're doing, you're not really working. And obviously he's in that, he's in that mode, mm -hmm. but that's, that's just my initial Thoughts, yeah. but he's he's man. It seems like this is just the only. This is only the beginning. There's probably so much stuff that he can definitely um, achieve in his lifetime. But yeah, that's just my initial thoughts. Yeah, I mean, some of my initial thoughts are. I mean, the guy just seems sincere. Yeah, you know what I mean. He he's like he has Asperger's or has whatever that disease is. He has that it makes it difficult for him. I think to emotionally connect with other people i think mm. um but he seems very thoughtful very sincere which is not not a typical characteristic you would find with you know that type of mentality and the success that he's had and he's very thoughtful um and he's you know as he shared he had an existential uh threat to his worldview when he was a teenager mm. because he really is was trying to figure out what the purpose of life is, you know? Mm. And I'm just, you know, that's the one thing I kind of took away is so far, it just seems pretty yeah. sincere. And when he, when he is asking a question, he sincerely wants to know the answer. Mm. So I thought that that's what kind of sticks out to me. And, and even he recognizes that understanding yeah. what's the purpose of life is important, right? If you don't, if you don't have a purpose, then what's the point? Yeah. Well, and that, and that's and just to add an example, 
that's kind of the main reason why he bought the company Twitter before it was called X, because mm -hmm. that was his contribution. Because he knows, he, growing up in South Africa, when you restrict uh, a lot of freedom of speech and things are being um, canceled and stuff, that is that is a that is a pathway to chaos and oppression so i mean he's he's done a lot because i don't think he had to buy twitter mm -mm, this was no. more this was more of what he what he saw and like his contribution so i i'm thinking this is the first step there's going to be probably some opportunity in the future that he can do something for good because he like what you said looks like he is very sincere and genuine with trying to make the world a better place than he you know kind of be, you know than than the time before but like like i said i think i don't know he's he seems to be a tool that is being utilized for for the for the better so for a lot of good yeah like you're yeah. saying and and here's a couple funny things just kind of you know trivial things is you, his grandfather was from minnesota wow. and i think his grandmother was from canada and he moved to south africa because his his grandfather was like an engineer and mm -hmm. he wanted to test fly stuff and he couldn't really do it in America. So he moved to South <laughs> Africa. So uh, really when you, when you, when you dig into his roots, mm. he's American, you know, by two mm. generations back, he's American. So I thought that was interesting. That is um, interesting. The other thing is he, he obviously made his money with PayPal right? When he sold PayPal, made hundreds of millions of dollars. So he goes and buys Tesla mm. and starts SpaceX. Mm. And he only believes that they had like a 10% chance of being successful. Yes. But he threw all his money, like all hundreds of millions of dollars of his. But why did he do that? Because he said, hey, if it's important enough, mm. then, then you that's what you do. You know, then that's kind of coming back to like why I mean, he's very, this is a guy when he believes something, he, he puts his time and energy behind it. And he, he's willing to go penny all in. Yes. That's the price. Mm. So I mean, the, yeah. the guy's legit, man, he's legit. So that's what I'm kind of taking. You know, he obviously is trying to find what the purpose of life is mm. for whatever reason. He, the, the scriptures don't make sense to him. Um, mm. So yeah, he he actually finds it in some novel, which <laughs> like he's talking about here, like the Earth is. Here, here's the other thing. Forty-two. Um, I think he 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 says something here where you know the question, you know, it's about. Let me see here. Um. So, so then I was like, man, I, I'm just like struggling to find meaning in life here. And then I read uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And basically what Douglas Adams was saying is that we don't really know what the right questions are to ask. Like the question is not what's the meaning of life, uh, you know, uh, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I hmm. found that to be very, very true, believe it or not, where he says that he understands we don't even know what questions to ask. Mm. And, and, and to me the scriptures are relatively clear that that's true mm. because because even god has to inspire us to ask the right question mm. like that's 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 how like the gap is so big from where we are in a fallen to where god is that we can't even come up with the right questions that's how bad it is that you mm. have to be inspired to to ask the right questions so that you can get the right answer. And then even when you ask the right question and the answer comes, you have to pray again to understand the answer. This is why I think mm. like God is very, very, he always tells us be very specific with what you ask. And you have to mm. be inspired with what you ask because why? what you ask is either going to help you improve or it's going to destroy you. So you have to be very careful about what you ask. And what he says there, I think is very true. We don't even know the right questions to ask. And, mm. you know, so he's touching on some very interesting 
principles that you know, spiritual I feel stuff. Like he, I, yeah. He, He's getting so close, yet he's so far. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like he's getting so close, but it's just far enough that that connection can't be made for whatever reason, which is kind of crazy because of how intelligent he is. But once again, temporal intelligence is not the same thing as spiritual intelligence and knowledge. And those that's what I kind of kind of took from watching him. I was like, man, he's so smart in the world or on the earth and on temporal things. And he's getting so close to the spiritual stuff, but he just can't make that connection for whatever reason. Mm. Okay. So we'll continue here. Obviously, in the earth, earth, it turns out, is this big computer. That's And, and its goal is to uh, answer the question, what's the meaning of life? And, and earth yeah. comes up with the answer 42. Uh, this is where the 42 number comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, and 420 is just 10 times 42. Yeah, in in that book, with it, which is really sort of a book about, it's an existential philosophy book, uh, disguised as <laughs> as humor. They they come to the conclusion that no, the the real problem is is trying trying to formulate the the question, and to really have the right question, you need a much bigger computer than Earth. And so, huh. I mean, I'd like one way, of, I think, way of, of characterizing this would be to say the. <clears throat> The universe is the answer. What is the question? What are the questions? The more we can expand the scope and scale of consciousness, the better we can understand what questions to ask about the answer that is the universe. The, the more we can expand consciousness, uh, become a multi planet species, ultimately a multi cellar species, we have a chance of figuring out what the hell's going on. And so, and this this is this is why I think we should have more humans and 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 more digital both both biological and digital consciousness. Hmm. You know, he talks there about this is why we have to have more humans. Do you know yeah. he's advocating? He goes all yeah. around and says we don't have a overpopulation problem. We, we have more, a yeah. underpopulation yeah. problem. Any yeah. thoughts yeah. on some of the comments there, Musi? No, that's I know he's been a big proponent of encouraging people to to have uh children because like what you said there is a uh, there's no there's yeah there's there's not an issue of overpopulation because many parts of the world are actually decreasing and i think he talks about this that you know every year i think there's a decrease of of couples having less and less and less children mm -hmm. i mean for example here in, in new zealand there is a huge deficit and the only way for New Zealand to grow is immigrate, Im getting people to immigrate here, most likely from India, uh, China, and the Philippines, because within the New Zealand population, no one is thinking of yeah. having children. So there, there, and he is, he is correct. Um, he is correct in that big time because, but the thing is, right, there's this whole big uh, push, and that's why he's kind of battling the idea of the whole big push of the global warming or the climate change and people think that the world is going to end or come to an end soon. So people don't want to have kids because it's another, you know, adding uh, pressure to the problem. To the yeah. problem. So yeah, the, those are, those are my thoughts. And then just the, the whole other um, uh, answers from uh, Elon Musk on the, on the earth and the right questions. I think, you know, we kind of touched on it. Um, Get, knowing the right question so you can under, get the answer is probably uh, the diff, you know, very difficult. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's just my thoughts. No, and that's, I mean, this is the thing is, he, I agree with him that the universe and the earth is the answer. Um, the only problem is, is we're in a fallen earth. And when you're and in a fallen universe, quote unquote, probably that as you try to get the answer about the earth and the universe, you're not going to get the right answers. Number one, you may never get the answer mm. because it's so vast and so big. But if if you're if you're going to uh, study and approach this from a temporal perspective you're limited to temporal knowledge and this is why this is why i just i feel for the guy and i'm grateful that you know 
God loves us enough that he reaches out to us because literally what, what God is trying to tell us from my perspective is the knowledge and the truth he wants to give us is unattainable for us to get to where he is, right? Mm. We've come into a fallen world and the only way you can understand the whole plan for us is for God to reveal to us a bigger picture beyond just the universe, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, but, dude, there's a lot of benefit in understanding this world, right? The technology, the healthcare, all that other stuff. There's a lot of yeah. benefits to it. But, I, you know, I feel like he's asking the right questions, but he's pursuing the answers, unfortunately. Okay. I, I don't believe he's going to find the answers he thinks he's looking for. <laughs> by by studying the universe and and mm. so forth it, it'll get you it will kind of hint you in the right direction but the universe is not going to ultimately tell you the purpose of life in my opinion but, yeah and, well no and i'm just thinking i think those answers yeah those answers like i said you're only gonna find and find it in a spiritual sense and usually you get those spiritual um as per uh, inspiration or spiritual knowledge is from scriptures right mm -hmm. and i think you already mentioned it to me that he he can't understand the the scriptures for some reason so that's mind-blowing you know to me to me that's mind-blowing because he's such a smart guy it's obvious what he's done and it's evident but you know temporal stuff but like yeah it's crazy what he's seeking for to get those answers like i said it's gonna take spiritual inspiration and or knowledge and the only way to kind of receive that is probably you know your own personal revelation that's usually triggered by scriptures mm -hmm. studies or, sp or spiritual experiences um, yeah experiences right or participating in spiritual ceremonies or something but yeah i don't know that's just my thoughts also just to add on to that yeah i mean and that's that's yeah i mean because the guy Nobody doubts how smart this guy is, mm. temporal knowledge, mm. you know, but um, unfortunately, he he it seems quite obvious from this, his spiritual knowledge and his ex spiritual experiences and the knowledge of God is not not at the same level of his temporal knowledge. Let's put it that way. There's mm. a, you know, there's a big gap when you compare his temporal knowledge to his spiritual knowledge. But. He's at least being sincere, and that makes mm. me think, hey, maybe one day he'll turn mm. the corner. But let's see to the rest of it. Um, and why should we become a multi plant species and a multi stellar species is so that we can understand the nature of the universe. And then in, in order for that to occur, then we have to make sure that things are good on Earth. Um, you know, on Earth to, to despair. Uh, so sustainable energy is important listing your house on the market isn't the only way to sell your house selling to us is much faster so that's yeah that's pretty much the majority of that video yeah no yeah. very very interesting and there's there's yeah like what well, like i think you mentioned there's an attempt right he's just trying to yeah. figure it but i think you also added he's probably not going to find he's not going to find that outcome currently unless there's some spiritual um intervention i guess not 100 percent, yeah or spiritual uh search or i don't know but well i mean and that's that's really what what it comes down to is if god doesn't reveal himself to us we mm. can search the universe and never come to understand god exactly oh, yeah. we'll understand how this fallen earth and universe exists right mm. because at the end of the day everything's falling apart mm. now the, the universe wants to decay uh entropy everybody recognizes that but interesting yeah that i just i thought that was kind of a, a cool thing nice no that's to, cool that's cool. Cool, interview. Yeah. cool interview sweet with that let's transition over to another cool video and that this one is about Polynesians and why some of the unique characteristics of Polynesians. Let me 
share the screen. All right, let's watch this real quick. Pacific Islanders. Polynesians are a warrior race. They literally descend from warriors and voyagers, not like Europeans who use technology for war or black people <laughs> who are mainly peaceful <laughs> and receive their attributes due to location and tropical diseases. Pacific Islanders were authentic warriors. In our day, amongst blacks and whites, Pacific Islanders dominate the NFL and rugby. Pound for pound, <laughs> they are the strongest and most powerful on average. It's insane. They put on mass ridiculously fast. They are ridiculously mm. strong. In fact, if they would focus on strongman and powerlifting instead of just rugby and American football, they would dominate. I mean, look at Dwayne Johnson. Yes, he's half <laughs> black, but he is also half Samoan. And yet again, looking at his physique and his athletic history, it's no surprise. Where do Pacific Islanders come from? It's hard to say for sure, but it seems that like they are a mix of Melanesians and Southeast Asians that migrated thousands of years ago. So what makes them so amazing? Well, the main reason I believe is their culture. Polynesians were warriors and voyagers. They would travel at sea for long periods of time to seek other places to live. They would fight in close combat rather than distance fighting that was common in other groups of humans in other parts of the world. Let's look at the effect voyaging has had on their genetics. Navigating the seas for long durations of time would have led to starvation for some. So as a result, many would have died and their genetics would have faded out. However, those who survived would have been those who had enough energy for their body to use for fuel. What's the energy? It's fat. Let's pause there real quick. Any thoughts, Masi? Um, just the, that little correction, you know, um, he's saying we're, we're, what are, you know, the makeup of the Polynesians, he said Melanesian and a mix Southeast of South Asian. Yeah. yeah. You know how we, we, we think, um, there, you know, my, my perspective on that is that, um, there is, uh, there probably some mix, but a big part of our DNA makeup, we believe is from the Americas, but yeah, other than that, I mean, uh, it's definitely true with the whole size uh, and, and, and fast development. Many kids, even if I see here, a lot of the Polynesian kids here, uh, specifically the like uh, Tongan and Samoan descent, they tend, you know, you get the, the six-year-olds to stand in line and they take a, a, a group photo. Those people from <laughs> those backgrounds tend to be a lot more bigger and mm. more filling out compared to the 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 asian and uh, caucasian uh race and yeah i mean that probably plays a big reason why we dominate a lot of the sports we're in um yeah we just physically physically i don't think there's another race that can really compare especially on average on yes, average on average, right? on yeah. average. because so, you yeah. you always when you go to larger populations you're gonna get bigger and smaller but when we talk about that the, the consistency of the recipe it's mm. it's hard to beat the polynesians and um i mean i think the biggest kid i ever saw that was still in primary mussy was six three and 300 pounds that is like 11 years old he's sitting up there at the primary program you know he was sitting there with his arms like this and like he's like twice the size of the bishop you know, Holy you know, snap. he's sitting next to another 11 year old that's like six foot and like 200 pounds, which is a huge kid already at yeah. 11 years old. Makes that kid look like a little baby, you know, and, and just like some of the Polynesians now, I think I feel like the kids are just getting bigger, man. Like, yeah, some yeah. of the guys in the NRL, I didn't realize a lot of these guys are like six, five, six, six huge guys you yeah. know and just running at incredible speeds but yeah I, it's it's hard to deny now man like and we're just at and what's crazy is we're just getting started that's the other thing that's mind-blowing it's and only here, gonna get bigger and bigger and yes. bigger and here's my theory too uh, like this is my theory if new zealand let's just say if new zealand wasn't under the um the british influence with the whole rugby stuff and new zealand was more of like the american Samoa, which they play football american football like in high school and stuff i'm telling you the increase of nfl of, of polynesian descent that would because i think right now 
you know, it's mostly uh, the the blacks. I think there's what is it, sixty percent or mm-hmm. seventy? Yeah, sixty percent. We would we would we would probably make up a huge amount of percentage of uh, participation. I don't. I'm I'm thinking maybe at least a quarter, twenty five. If New Zealand was it, and now and I I, mean, I share this with um, Lee. I would say I'm telling you if because the way the All Blacks have dominated using the Polynesians to dominate rugby, I'm telling you, it, it would have been a different case if New Zealand really put the emphasis or focus on uh, American football. That's just my theory. but No, I, but yeah. dude, that's not even, like, far-fetched at all, man. Yeah. I mean, for for how small of a population we're already outperforming on NFL representation, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, to, to think that that's not, I mean, just look at um, Jordan Mailata, the story of Jordan Mailata, right? Never played a single down of football drafted. Now he's a, has a $100 million contract. The Eagles just took another kid, same thing. Tongue kid, played, yeah. Yeah, tongue yeah. kid, never played a down of football. They're bringing him on the team. And, and I agree 100%. I mean... The all black you remove Polynesians in general from New Zealand rugby, they aren't yeah. gonna be the most winningest team in no. the world, no. like professional team. Like you you take away the Polynesians, and that's I mean, and and just look at uh France now, you're starting mm-hmm. to see like four or five it's Polynesians yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, England yeah. traditionally now for many many years now. Wales has a yeah. couple Tongan guys there. I mean Japan, uh, Polynesian. The Polynesians are just now. Pretty mm-hmm. soon you're gonna go to every World Cup and almost every team. I I, I saw that Romania was trying okay. to qualify for the yeah. the World Cup and I see like two Tongan guys and maybe a Samoan wow. guy on the team. And I'm just like. Man, there's going to come a point we're going to go to the Rugby World Cup and every team has a Polynesian on Polynesian. it. And uh, I, I'm, I'm also thinking, you know, just with how rugby even started to be professional and really kind of propelled rugby was a Polynesian, Jonah, Jonah. Lowe. Oh, yeah. Right? Did it, isn't he the reason why rugby is, it, it he is what almost, it is today? He almost single-handedly saved the rugby union. Yeah. Because rugby union was going down the drain, right? They were yeah. forced. They did not want to go professional because rugby league was yeah. on a high in the late mid eighties yeah. coming up, and rugby union was on the decline. And then they go Jonah professional, Lomo. and then you just get a freak like yeah. Jonah Lomo, like you know that that was already happening. The Jordan Mailata story was already happening with Jonah Lomo. The yeah. Cowboys wanted to take him to the NFL. Right, mm. they they and 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 Jonah confirms it. He had an offer on mm. the table from the Cowboys, but he he seemed to be more of a homebody. He didn't mm. want to kind of go outside of what he was comfortable with. He was very comfortable with New Zealand. His dream was to be an All Black. So now that we're having this conversation, man, like the the move into the NFL is just a natural progression of what's happened in rugby and and yeah. everywhere else and it's just it's just yeah it's crazy it's crazy yeah, it is it is so we'll come back here and continue here and then we'll come back cuz he's he's going to talk about he's on the navigation okay fat is stored energy for later use so those who had more body fat would have been able to survive longer and therefore pass their genes on. This is why Polynesians can put on fat so fast. You see, (laughs) to have enough excess body fat for energy, they would need to be able to store as many calories from eating as possible, rather than using the energy up through things like heat. So the people who had more body fat at the time of the voyage were the people whose bodies were more efficient at storing the calories they ate as fat. Their genes would have passed on as they were the main ones surviving. So as Mm. a result, their descendants now are able to gain mass extremely fast compared to other groups of humans. You can see this as they have the highest rates of obesity in the world. What effect does fat have on strength? Well, the heavier you are, the easier it is to exert your power. So the increased body weight was an advantage. This size advantage would have assisted them in warfare, which is the next point. 
Wars happened between different groups of Pacific Islanders. For example, when settling on... Any thoughts on that, Masi? Uh, I think it's very true. Um, during those long voyages and when you're traveling in the ocean, I feel like it does weed out maybe the weaker gene and they just end up being sick and die and leaving the stronger person who can who, who probably has the capacity to store more fat to last the voyage and his gene probably was was onward and passed down probably you know up to today and many people like that and that's why we do have probably the physically have the strongest and bigger people because of because of that uh practice um but yeah i mean that to me that that makes totally sense yeah, I, I agree. I mean, and that and that just once again, another data point on how wide and how far away the Polynesians traveled, right? Because you got to remember, like the Europeans were behind in, in technology regarding navigating on boats. Yeah. Right. The European ships that used wind were almost one directional. Right. Because the sails didn't pivot. They didn't have the mm. crab sails and you couldn't move the masts. Mm. The Polynesians, that's why it didn't matter which direction the wind was blowing. You could always harness it to travel in the in the direction that you wanted to go, which was not always the case. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I do believe that that probably played a bigger role. I mean, obviously. War is kind of the case but one would argue tonga and samoa did not traditionally have a lot of wars because they were relatively peaceful you know mm. obviously when there was times of chaos there were chaos but they weren't from what we understand unless you understand something different for for example like tonga tonga for the majority was very peaceful now granted yeah. they would go on on uh, raids and stuff when things were getting yeah. a little crazy to Fiji and maybe some yeah. other places, but some other islands, yeah. especially, yeah. Especially when you have a lot of peaceful times and not only that, I think we mentioned how Tonga was very structured, you yeah. know, your role. And obviously if somebody has potential or wants to be a rebel, they're not going to do it in Tonga where they can be subdued. They're going to take it somewhere in some of the, some of the boys or some of the group, go somewhere and maybe pick on a, a relative or a distant cousin, which is not so bad than your immediate family. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Because there, there are stories, especially when I've lived here and, and mingled with a lot of the, um, you know, the, the people that are not so popular, like in the U S with the Tongan and Samoans, there's the, you know, the Cook Islands, there's you know, quite a few, the new way uh, Tuvalu and, and they all have stories. <laughs> they all have stories of Tongans coming to their island and doing whatever they wanted kind of yeah thing. And, and that's what i feel like it was when you have so much peaceful and their structure for you know hundreds of years you there's kind of just i'm just knowing human behavior there's you get you and quite a few guys like they would go fiji and you know do whatever they wanted get you know because it was just normal for that behavior to do whatever you wanted and you're doing it to maybe distant relatives like i said it's not as bad when you're doing it to your immediate relative but I, that's just me that's just yeah. me what i'm thinking and they will quite a few will go around so yeah that's that's just that's just me <laughs> no I, I yeah and you're right i mean the the younger guys who wanted war they go to mm. fiji like fiji mm. was a very popular destination for the younger guys who wanted you know, to get into the war action, you go to Fiji because when you come back to Tonga, 90% of the time, there's no war going on. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's that's hilarious. It's better to go beat up your distant cousin than your first cousin. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. We. On different lands, wars would embark between the new settlers and the ones living there. Wars happened a lot. We can still see remnants of the war culture in the haka that they do in rugby. And of course, if fighting was a large part of their history and culture, there would be no surprise that their descendants would be built like warriors. Think about it. If we all descended from the best UFC fighters, we would all have favorable genetics for fighting, <laughs> especially because their fighting was close combat. This would require a lot of brute physical strength 
power and athleticism. Hence why, even at high body fats and body mass, a lot of Polynesians are still extremely athletic. So there was a constant mm. filtering out of the weak and coming out with the strong as a result of war. And of course, the successful warriors would be able to pass on their genes to their offspring. And what are the genes that would have passed on? Fast switch muscles for strength and power output. Dense bones with a wide structure. So stocky waist, hips mm. and broad shoulders. And of course, body fat. As a result, you have the strongest people on earth, on average. A real life warrior race, in a sense. They're really amazing. Money. Money plays a factor in the sports they play too. You see, strongman competitions, along with powerlifting, are not the most lucrative sports to pursue a career in. That's why they tend to lean more towards rugby and American football. And mm -hmm. of course, as a result, their culture mm -hmm. is largely influenced by this. So more and more people want to play rugby and become successful with that rather than any other sport though they would be very good at them. So to summarize, they have a broad structure, dense bones and a stocky build, and they put on mass ridiculously fast, that being both fat and muscle. This is mainly due to their voyaging and their warrior culture. The only disadvantage I can think of is their higher amounts of body fat. That's the <laughs> only disadvantage, solely because yeah. it isn't the best for an aesthetic physique in bodybuilding terms. Still aesthetic, but bodybuilding is of course very extreme. Besides that though, they put on mass extremely fast. Next, we're mm. gonna have a- Very yeah. interesting. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. don't have a lot to argue about that, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I was at one point, um, just to add on the disadvantage, because definitely our society has changed. It's a lot more, um, we don't have to, there's a lot more food around. Also, there, because we store so much and we're not burning it as fast, you know, um, we, we tend to have a lot more diabetes and stuff. And that's probably mm -hmm. the, the disadvantage and challenge for this, this day, because obviously those days it was a big benefit advantage a advantage. Right. And, um, that's probably the biggest challenge probably for all, um, Polynesia is, um, definitely because we have vehicles, we have, we have a lot more stuff abundance of food mm -hmm. um now so and we're not sailing um like all the time because we're we're flying in airplanes and stuff but probably that's another bis uh, another disadvantage that um polynesians are, are are facing at the moment but but yeah no and that's that's usually how life goes you know what's yeah. an advantage at one point is a disadvantage at another like you know, on one of the things that a lot of Polynesians struggle with is gout. I mean, I have gout. I get it sometimes. I think you get it too sometimes, yeah. Mashi. Yeah. But I was reading one time. Do you know when it was an advantage? When? Malaria. Mm. So high uric acid in your body apparently helps to Fight, overcome malaria. Overcome. And it doesn't outlast. kill you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So very helpful for the past mm. the ancestors right you exposed mm. to malaria yeah having the, the 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 high probability of getting gout was you know the the acid the uric acid in um, yeah in your body helped you survive malaria but now like you said now that malaria is not a problem mm -hmm. and there's a lot of meat and stuff mm -hmm. now now it works to a disadvantage and you just have yeah. to kind of figure that out yeah yeah Oh, that, that was a cool video, man. That was a cool yeah. video. Seemed like it did did a pretty good job. But the one thing yeah. you notice, as we've discussed in, in the past, did you notice all the flags that they had on top? Yeah. Yeah. They had Tonga, Samoa, Samoa. Or Western Samoa, American Samoa, and Fiji. Mm. And so Fiji, like we talked about, is kind of in the gray area. Yeah. There are definitely think... certain parts of Fiji that, you know, yes. But mm. Fiji's no, on the was, line. Yes, because I was going to say, right, Fiji was one of the few places that when Polynesia, the first Polynesians came, right, they were the first people on the island, but Fiji already had people in it, right? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was more of like that mix. It was kind of like that place where you go and mix. Because yeah. a lot of the Tongans would go and mix with the, with the native people that were already there. Yeah, and, and I mean, and, and a big part of it is because, um, oh, and you know what? A lot of it was because uh, they had the the trees there for mm. building the karia. You mm. know what I mean? There, there, were, there mm. was reasons why the Tongans kept going back to Fiji. 
there were yeah. certain resources, resources there that they couldn't find anywhere else. Yeah. And probably in, in uh, resources that was a uh, plenty yes. that they can always use. All right. Yeah. Well, What's with up? that being said, we're go I'm gonna try and find some of our let's go visit some of our videos and some of the comments there, Mashi. Okay. All right. Share screen. All right. What are some new questions? Hmm. Let's try this one and we'll scroll. Language is an indicator, but that, that doesn't exist. Can't base too much off of present comparison. So, uh, Southeast Asia changed tremendously over the centuries. Sure, okay, so th that's kind of their, his defense of that is because Southeast <laughs> Asia has changed a lot. And I was like, okay, well, yeah. that to us, that, that just means there's more <laughs> doubt, right? And that's yeah. what we're saying. We're saying is we're not quite convinced it's 100% has to be Southeast Asia. Mm. Um, since Christianity has come to play, our history has been tampered with making up false information. It shows we not only big for nothing, <laughs> very smart, and that's a liability and threat to them. Oh, he, <laughs> interesting. My idea. Let me see. How about here? Polynesian expansion and the real start of the Lapita people started in Maluku, Molouku, Melanesia, an okay. oppressed and occupied country by Indonesia next to West to Papua. West Papua. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, it's Janelle Tanelpi baby is, uh, they firmly believe in the Southeast Asian model, mm. right? Mm. I, I, how, about, how about that? No, I was just saying there's one, uh, the it's P312. What structure, what ideology? Just admit you're using the Book of Mormon as your source. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, this individual is very active on our page. Yeah, yeah. He or yeah. she uh, makes a lot of comments, and we don't, we know, we say, yeah, there's some, some stuff in there, you know. <laughs> But it's it's I not the only that, the only the thing. Yeah. So this is one we you we just uh, put on I recently. Did this, I did watch a, um, another show. And, and the comment that we got here is you you didn't watch it properly. <laughs> Don't know what that means. I'm waiting for them to post any evidence of their claims. All right, Basi, what do you think? What would be your answers? They're saying we don't have any evidence of our claims. And this is for the question for the the Americas, right? The debate. Yes. Between, well, like, so here's the evidence. Big one is, like we mentioned before, are the landmarks. There's the Ha'amonga and Tonga, mm -hmm. is there, there's, which is a sun gate. If you look it up, a sun gate in South America, I believe it's in Bolivia um where it stands i'll pull it up only, while you're talking yeah in bolivia where it stands it's a it's almost the same um built um uh rock or sun gate all the way from the americas to tonga so that's that's a huge huge uh evidence of where we kind of originated from um the other evidence is Tongans always, Polynesia or Tongans had always had the word uh, Vaihi, and that's always been been passed on. And that was the story of their ancestors always been told to them that they came from Vaihi. Vaihi means a land far, far away, meaning towards the Americas. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that's a, that's another one. Another one, also the um, lot of the lot of the fruits and some of the vegetables in Tonga originated from from the americas from my understanding yeah so to me that's another one that's another indicator of evidence where we came from so that's just my thoughts uh to uh, uh thank you for bringing it up though that's the sun gate 
in the Americas, and I believe it's currently in um, Bolivia. Yes, where and we can and you can get the hot monga out. There we go. There we go. And you can look it up exactly where it is in the, the is it the in the Google Maps where this is, but it's it's built for the same purpose. It's you know it's pretty close to each other and how it stands. And that was back in the the Americas. And to me, the only way to to replicate that, you got to have some knowledge of the people moving from one area to to mm -hmm. the other. So, yeah, I mean that that's just my thoughts too on that evidence for that question. If you have anything further to yeah. kind of add the, to that. The, the, the thing that I think that ITP312 is missing here is our position is the knowledge is a big part and it's the culture and the civilization. Like, like, like we discussed in the past, DNA doesn't tell you the culture and the civilization. What it tells you is where the genetic material came from, but it doesn't tell you where the ideas and the knowledge and the culture comes from. And mm -hmm. that's that that is the the difference in, in our philosophy versus ITP, right? Mm -hmm. ITP says, well, you need to have scientific yeah. uh, stuff. And my my joking but funny way to say it is. I would like to know if ITP took the vaccine or not and whether he was forced to or not, because what we're finding out now is a lot of the quote unquote science wasn't necessarily science. Mm. And so those who overly rely on the quote unquote science and the evidence. Yeah. Well, that is the Western way to look at the world. Yeah. And what we're saying is the Polynesian way to look at the world is not to look at those things. It's mm. to listen to our oral history, oral history, and then to understand our culture and where that comes from. And, mm. and a big part of our culture is that astronomical knowledge, like you said. The the uh, Sungate um, or Tangaloa's uh, road, the east to west yeah. on the equator, you mm. know, the knowledge from Maui. And how that, you know, the double V that was found on the Ha'amonga, that's found throughout the Americas. Yeah. Um, that, and so when you start looking at the mounds, the, you, mounds, you, yeah. the thousands of mounds in Tonga, and then you find those similar mounds throughout the Americas, like, yeah, what more, I mean, what that's more our evidence. evidence? That's, yeah. Exactly. I mean, and that's what I find interesting about ITP's position is he's he or she is coming with a very Western Western perspective. Western perspective. Yeah. yeah. And and you know, and the Western perspective, just like we talked about earlier about efficiency with food and with mm. without there are benefits of the Western perspective, but it yeah. also comes with negatives, right? And we're coming with the Polynesian perspective to try and highlight the positives. And we also recognize there's certain negatives that the, the Polynesian perspective won't cover the same way that the Western science will do. But he uh, he or she just seems to be very happy with just accepting yeah. what the Western perspective is. And what we're saying is, well, good for you, but we're not we're not 100 percent happy with that. Yeah. Let's see. This one also yeah, has yeah. 600 um, comments. So how is oh yeah very interesting two thousand. <laughs> Here's a very good one here from Joe Mama, used <laughs> originally from Samoa. <laughs> Look, looks like uh, the Tongan Tongan Terrace is, is is already answering all those questions. The Samoan Tourism Authority literally says y'all came from Tonga on their website, but okay. <laughs> 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 That is pretty funny. That is pretty funny. <laughs> hey, Tong and Terrorist, be nice, please. Be nice. Here's a, another another one here. It says, in our history, we never talk or mention Tonga as our origins or where we come from. We are Samoa, the sacred place of the Pacific, the heart of the Pol of Polynesians. Looks like there's a couple replies. Nope, wrong again. <laughs> Lapita people not just arrive in Tonga first. 
some they still continue till they found Samoa and start building their homes and their own culture. We never come from Tonga, but we all come from Lapita. Mm. Okay. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Um well when you say Lapita is we you know that's same from the what Southeast Asia area mm-hmm. or region. Like I think we mentioned that's not the case came from the Americas there. I'm not going to rule out because one, you're going to need some population growth and that's by traveling different areas and getting up to Southeast Asia to get more people and interacting and mingling with those people. But the main source of like, like you mentioned, our culture, agriculture, our, our science, our religion is all based from the Americas. So, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, and to me, when when the first people came from um, from Vahi or from the Americas, I I I I believe when they came and settled uh, Tongatapu, the island, probably there was a few that continue on to go to Samoa because um, that is a close, really close relative, you know, of like we talk about Tonga being the root and then the branches and you know the how the branches kind of spurred out. Samoa is really right there, really yeah. close with Tonga, and probably have the most, um, what, intermarriages between those two people or islands, you know, in the day. So, I mean, I'm not going to rule that out, but saying coming from La Pizza, I think, is uh, inaccurate. Yeah. My, my, my thoughts are to, to this comment is Tonga has a very unique, position here and and i'll explain it this way like we've discussed many times Hmm. samoa as a country never existed until colonization i mean that's that's the reality right yeah tonga can say we existed as a country for thousands of years because why we had a tui tonga Tonga. this tui tonga ran an empire for thousands of years so the the identity as a nation Tonga can say yes yeah because of the Tui Tonga because yeah. the Tui Tonga and everybody in the Polynesia recognizes that yeah the Samoa, Fiji, Cook Islands, even Hawaii those are nations that did not exist those are Europeans cutting up Polynesia because yeah. they were being colonized by different people and you had to categorize them in some way yeah but when you say Tonga, and I and I, you know, I I know we reference Tonga so much because we mm-hmm. we all think that way, mm-hmm. Tonga Samoa. But the reality is, Samoa, Tonga, Cook Islands, uh, all of Polynesia was one nation, and the capital mm. was Tonga. Correct. That was the nation. It got carved up later on, but that was the nation. So. With that being said, like we've talked about, we've already discussed the Tui Manua. There is not enough cultural, astronomical, yeah. religious information to say that is where the civilization comes from. And, and then to add on that, Samoa says they come from a god named Tangaloa, and Tonga says... That wasn't a god. It was just a dude who lived here and was the king. And yes. then there was a transition to the Tui Tonga, just like, and that's what I find interesting. The transition from Tangaloa to the Tui Tonga is the same thing that happened from the Tui Tonga to Taufa to Taufa Hau to Po the First. Yes. There was a transition in the structure of the power and the government, but it was the same family. Same group of people and its continuation of independence and rule. Yes. Yes. So Samoa is Tonga. Tonga is Samoa in many ways. We're all just one big nation, but it's hard for me not to see that the origin and the capital doesn't come from Tonga. And like yes. we said, you know, we 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 do believe in DNA. My DNA says I have some. Fijian blood, some Samoan blood, um, and Tongan. So, you know, we're we're all yeah. intermingled and all related in in many ways. 
Yeah. No, and another thing, I mean, just, just to add why er all the roads lead to Tonga being the capital and being an important part of Polynesian history, just like the history of Rome, how the Romans would create all these roads throughout Europe and everywhere, but it all led to Rome because yep. that's where the empire and its capital start. And it's the same, you can take that same philosophy just to apply it to now that the branches and all the road, everything was lead to 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 Tonga because that was the capital of the empire. So it's the same yeah. thing. And I think that that's easy to understand for, for people why the Romans were known for building roads and wide roads just to have easier access to the capital. And exactly. It's the same same philosophy to Tonga. So that's no, that's, and then that, that's to help the our viewers to un see it that way. Well, and and I, you know, I went to Samoa, visited there. Mm. I'll tell you one thing: I see a lot more different types of sweet potato, yams, bananas, and and stuff that Samoa doesn't have the same wide variety of of agricultural goods. Like plants and stuff and mm -hmm. and so yeah i mean i agree it's <laughs> what i think is interesting is the same the same people that comment here we want to see the evidence yes. right are the same people who come and claim samoa is the cradle with no evidence no mm -hmm. real evidence of and and we don't have to have scientific evidence we're even willing to accept because a big part of our position is show us the structure the 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 astronomical astronomical knowledge, knowledge. The, that came from Samoa with the with the with the knowledge of that being passed throughout Polynesia exactly you know we're willing to accept that because we we recognize that that is a very viable reason so last one last one Masi a lot of people really loved your comments on the shift yeah very uh, interesting. potential shift from you know believing in Southeast Asia um oh did mm -hmm. we already look at that was oh. it this one yeah Let we didn't look see. at the bottom ones here yeah someone here saying hey i was told growing up we're from the americas, the americas. yeah mm -hmm. yeah and that's what i think um you know dad was the same way he was always told by the elders when he was serving car we came from uh Vahi, known as the word Vahi is to the Americas. And uh, he was just shocked when uh, he went to the U.S. and finding all these uh, uh, academics uh, writing in the books saying that we came from Southeast Asia, and which which kind of propelled or inspired him to, to do what he's doing uh, now, to kind of uncover the true history mm. of Polynesia. So same, person, same. Oh, go ahead, Masi. No, no, I was just going to say same like that person that commented uh how he's always been told came from the americas same same story told to uh dad so this is an interesting thing because this uh maori helper here mm -hmm. says come down from egypt as the kushites were the masters of the water cause uh, of the nile river what's very what? interesting about this is a lot of the astronomical knowledge and even mm -hmm. the double v that's found mm -hmm. in Tonga, that's found in the Americas, is also found in Egypt. Okay. So there is definitely some type some of connection, connection. Um, through the Egypt uh, and the Americas and coming down. Mm -hmm. When you look at the astronomical knowledge, obviously kings, and, yeah. and this is another interesting thing in Tonga, when they speak, you know, the in the kind of like the traditional setting, when they say the sun of Tonga, like the sun in the mm. sky, mm -hmm. they're typically referencing the king. Mm -hmm. And that was also true of Egypt. Of when they reference the pharaoh. Yes. As the you sun. Know, that is the true. Sun. Huh. Because Ra, the, the pharaoh descends from Ra, the god of the sun. And so the, there is a relationship yeah, between, a point. between pharaoh. So the... the Maori helper right here that we we agreed there seems to be a connection there um mm -hmm. just because of that well i wanted to add too i mean you know tonga also has the you know the cultural practice of uh circumcision which yeah. is based in that area you know i wouldn't be surprised maybe it could be the time when the jews were 
were were in Egypt or maybe before that. But I mean, Tonga has um, cultural practices that even go back to the Middle East in that region. So yeah, I mean, um, good point. And you know, who knows, man? Like, no, and, and like you were, and like we discussed, I think when we were talking about uh, William Mariner, George Vason, one of his observations was a lot of the Tongan culture seems to be related to ancient Israel practices, yes. like the circumcision, because, like all these, you know. Yes, because the circumcision, right, was only practiced among the Jews. From Well, from yes, I, I mean, that. supposedly it was done by other cultures as well, but it okay. was the Jews that were specifically said, this is a unique identifier of a covenant with God. Okay. I mean, I've heard some people say that other people practiced it. Okay. But but here's the thing. My answer to that is God spoke with other people too. Just like God made covenants with the Nephites, he could have made covenants with other people and they didn't keep their end of the deal. You know, the Jews so far to this day, God still recognizes them. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah. Any any other thoughts? Closing thoughts, Masi? No, just just like what you mentioned, God um, probably spoke or visited other people, and that's the same um, belief that I that I understand too with Jesus Christ after his crucifixion, that he visited different parts of the world, and you know who knows, you know, people probably picked it up from there to be rec you know to recognize the covenant to God, but yeah. No, and it's, and it's, I'm, you know what? I know we said closing thoughts, but this is, I think this is important too because we also believe that Hikuleo is the God of Israel, right? Because God of Israel spoke and all they heard was the voice because they weren't willing, they weren't willing to go up with Moses to see God face to face. So God had to speak to them. Hikuleo. In, in Tongan oral history is the God. And actually, you know, talking with dad, the Polynesian eyes, these eyes are also Hikuleo's eyes. One of the inspirations for the logo is those are Hikuleo's eyes that led Tangaloa and Maui and uh, the priests to Tonga. Mm. Like they, they didn't just get blown by the wind and landed on Tonga's like they were led by the voice that led them to Tonga. And, you know, there's that story in Tongan origin of, you know, the, the Q. Mm. The, I don't know what the Q, what's the, the name for Q in English, but it's that bird that cuts the worm into three pieces. Mm. And they say, that's the origin of, of where Tongans come Tonga. from. Yeah. Um, and and in it it says that the three pieces were kohai, koau, momo, and momo, yeah. and, momo. and uh what are your thoughts? Have you heard any or have any thoughts on that origin story and any kind of things you've heard on discussions on how that may relate to where where Tongans could have originated from? Uh, no, I mean, just how it happened of Tonga being so small and, and it's just, you know, Momo meaning such a crumb and how it happened. Um, you know, nothing too, nothing too deep or anything, uh, to us, but, um, it's the same story like what you told of how Tonga kind of originated from the Q, uh, bird pecking the worm and then breaking it in three parts, but Momo being the smallest, um, you know, and then isn't there the the Kohai and Kowau are just other people that also said at different parts of Tonga? Or how does it? How does where? What's the Kohai and Kowau? I'm I'm not. Yeah, so supposedly those were the three first Tongans, right? Which okay. one could make the argument that that could represent the three founding fathers of Tonga of Maui, Maui Tangaloa, and, and the priests. Uh, Pulu, that would, yes. You know, yes. with, who lived in Pulotu. So, Pulotu. Um, yeah, I think that, you're, you're correct. That, that's, that's my understanding. One, yeah. yeah. And and what one thing that um, was interesting to me uh, is 
when you look at the scriptures, when God first speaks to a prophet, usually when he first reveals, he'll usually say, who is it? Mm. And then the prophet will say, it's me, Samuel. Oh, it's me, Moses. It's me, Jacob. Mm -hmm. And Tongan oral history just kind of like the scriptures seems to have layers of meaning built into it. Uh -huh. And one of the things that, that sticks out to me is Kohai, Koau, Momo. And we uh -huh. all know what, you know, it's that, that seems to me like you could take an interpretation that that's Hikuleo speaking and saying, who's there? Who is it? And the mm -hmm. person responds, wow. Wow, Momo. And if we and if we believe that Hikuleo led our ancestors to Tonga, that could also be an interpretation of when Hikuleo revealed himself to our forefathers to say, it's time to leave and I'm going to lead you to the Pacific Ocean to Polynesia mm. and then I mm. will I will give you that land right I'll give that for you as your inheritance if you're willing to follow me and that's literally what our oral history says our oral history says that Hikuleo led us Hikuleo is the god of Pulotu mm. right he's the god mm. of heaven or the spirit world mm. and he led our ancestors to Tonga and yeah. that's what that's what was used to build up the Tongan it's Empire, from, the civilization. Yes, exactly. And so, yeah, I, I just that was something as you know, this kind of popped up to me. Mm. Kind of interesting. It's like, man, maybe this is a a dialogue between Tangaloa Maui and and Hikuleo and uh, and Hikuleo, where he's saying, "Yeah, hey, Koao Momo, I'm here." Mm. The small, the small remnant, right? Some people mm. can make that interpretation. Mm. I'm the small remnant, Momo, or mm. whoever. But yeah, uh, that's something Great I kind of believe in. Yeah, yeah. No, and 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 I agree along those lines too. Um, and I feel like the further we we find out all these little details, I think the clearer it'll become in the future. And like I said, if we just if we dig up some other evidence new new evidence will come up and then over time we'll just find out who's the correct uh who has the correct theory so exactly because i think i think you know the the recent one that came out what the urbanization and they're saying the urbanization and the knowledge of tonga um um ha practicing this is obviously dating it even further back so you know yeah yeah and and that's you know in the meantime we'll have fun having conversations yeah. on it, exploring. We really do appreciate, I mean, the, the responses on, on yes. social media, the comments. Interactions. This is, this and is all what we this want. Discussion. We need, yes. we need to have the conversation. We yes. don't take it personal. If you, you know, bring your ideas and we would yes. love, we would love. We just started uh, our interview uh, series, right? Because yeah. we started with Devi Tafale. Uh, he is the founder of the Polynesianized Foundation. So we thought it was appropriate that he would be the first person interview. We're going to start having interviews. If you want to share your perspective and want to join us for a Talanoa here on the Polynesianized podcast, you yes. know, as long as we're respectful and we share ideas, that is how our ancestors conversed that's how ideas were developed they sat down talanoa. they drink yeah. the kava and talanoa we don't have a digital kava to drink but we mm. can definitely have the conversations and honestly reach out to us on all of our yeah. social media platform if you want to come on join us for a conversation but uh i think until then that will wrap us up for today Masi. last words uh nope Appreciate everyone's feedback and discussion and just, you know, generating this uh, interest. Um, everyone is trying to seek the truth. And we're just, um, you know, we're just uh, two people from uh, New Zealand and uh, America and Texas just 
having the same interest. We want to find the truth and see um, where our origins are from. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for your um, comments. Thank you, Tua, for creating this platform. Appreciate everyone. That's it for me. Till next time. Sweet. See ya.